welcome to the 2021 Mardi Gras Shoebox Parade. Now this year's event is different, but we promise it will be a treat for kids of all ages. Prepare to learn from the experts at St. Louis's beloved attractions, learn to draw your favorite animals, and be wowed by the floats designed by St. Louis area students. Let's get started with Heidi Glaus at the St. Louis Aquarium. Thanks Blair and welcome to Union Station. You guys, if you have not been here in a while, you need to get here fast. There is so much to do and see. First off, you have the wheel and uh, by the way, it's heated so you don't have to worry about the temperatures. Then when you go inside the aquarium, I mean, sharks are swimming over you. It's absolutely amazing. Not to mention, you've got so many other things, the mirror and then can we talk about can we talk about the food? Holy cow. But that's really not the main attraction. The stars of all of this, the kids who made these absolutely incredible floats. Let's get to that. Kids from across the area have really put their creativity to use to celebrate some of their favorite places here at Union Station and across St. Louis. So check this out. We've got Stanley the lobster, which you can find inside. Cully the polar bear at the zoo. We gotta have City Museum because that Ferris wheel is on the rooftop. Keep going this way. Check this out. Somebody went all out for that octopus. These are amazing. So while the kids were creating those masterpieces, they came up with a few questions for the experts at their favorite destinations. So let's get some answers, starting with the expert here at the St. Louis Aquarium. I'm here with Kat Escobarian, animal care manager at the St. Louis Aquarium, which is amazing. First of all, how many animals do we have? Oh my gosh, we have so many animals here. We have probably over 20,000 animals here, individually. And sharks. <laughs> oh, and we have plenty of sharks, yes. We have seven different species of sharks here, so plenty of sharks, absolutely. Where do you find the kids usually gravitate to or give the most oohs and ahs? Oh gosh, that's such a great question because honestly throughout the entire place there are so many exciting things. We have a brand new uh, habitat, it's archer fish. Our guests are able to hold out feeding sticks and the archer fish spit and knock that food into the water. Then upstairs there's feeding turtles, there's animal ambassadors, and then of course getting over to touching the stingrays, feeding them, and then the sharks in Shark Canyon. There's too like, many! Because exactly. yes. we didn't even talk about Stanley, the blue lobster, That's or the right. otters! Oh my gosh, and the otters! Okay, so there's obviously lots to do and see, but we've got a couple of questions from our creative kids. Let's go to our first one. Hi, my name is Sakari, and I'm from Lafayette Prep Academy. I would like to know what some names are for the otters. So Corey, you did an amazing job with this float and that's a great question. So what are the names of the otters? Oh, I love that you asked. So we have three North American river otters here. We have two females who are Thatcher and Sawyer and one male who is Finn. They're actually all siblings and they just had their second birthday on December 30th. Do they get along? Sometimes, but sometimes like siblings, they do a little rough housing and then they have a little separate time and then they come back together and they're best of friends. So much fun. All right, next question. Hi, my name's Harley. I'm in third grade at the Village School and my approach about the ocean. I have a question for the aquarium. Why can't you explore the underground ocean and the earth? Because I want to know what's in there. Harley, you're so smart. I never even thought about that. Is there an underground ocean? So that is a fantastic question, you're right. There is an underground ocean. It is actually though about 400 miles beneath the Earth's crust. So it is quite a ways down there. We would love to know what is down there also. There's a fantastic researcher who I think that you would really love to learn a little bit more about, Dr. Sylvia Earle. If you haven't ever heard of her, definitely look up Dr. Sylvia Earle. 
She is an amazing explorer of the depths of our oceans. So Harley made this really cool float with turtles. How many turtles do we have here at the aquarium? Also awesome, we love the turtles. So we have about 30 turtles, aquatic turtles that are right here in this turtle feeding habitat where you can come and actually help to feed the turtles. Uh, we have a few different types of turtles, red-haired sliders, false map turtles, painted turtles. Then also we have two sea turtles in Shark Canyon. So that is pretty exciting too. Super exciting. Yeah. All right, next question. Hi, my name is Maddie and I'm 10 years old and I made a float about Stanley the Lobster from the St. Louis Aquarium. My question about blue lobsters are where are they found and why are they blue? Maddie, I don't know what's cooler, the question or your float. So what is the answer? So blue lobsters can be found any place where you can find lobsters. Blue lobsters though are so unbelievably rare. It is actually only one in two million lobsters that are that really unique rare blue color. And it just has to do with a specific protein that they produce uh, that obviously is very rare that then creates that blue color. We're so lucky to have him. How did we get him? So it's actually a super cool story. It was when we were getting ready to open up the aquarium here. And then of course the Blues won the Stanley Cup. So that was a really, really exciting time. And then a, uh, a restaurant in Maine contacted us and said, hey, we actually have a blue lobster. The blue lobster came in to be part of dinner, but they knew how rare that was. They had kept the blue lobster and then decided that they thought that he should be seen by uh, guests of the St. Louis Aquarium uh, in connection, of course, with the winning of the Stanley Cup uh, by the Blues. So uh, two of our team members actually went there to pick up Stanley and then bring him back here and then, of course, have his whole shrine <laughs> yeah. to Lord Stanley. It is really awesome and exciting. Yeah, we love him very, very much. That this is the perfect home. It is. Another amazing exhibit Stingrays. You actually get to touch them. Aren't they absolutely amazing? And guess what? We've got an artist from Sudlard who's going to teach you how to draw it. Hi, Heidi. I'm Earl Miller, a resident artist here at Sudlard Art Gallery. All right, the first thing we're going to learn how to draw is a stingray. It might look a little familiar to you because it also looks almost just like a kite. So I'm going to scoot over a little bit and just make a light line down part of the page and make a little mark. So that's the end of the body and then this much is tail. A stingray is basically the same width as it is tall. So we can take something like even use your pencil, if you want to use the ruler you can, and go up like a kite and make a couple little more. Then very lightly you take your pencil and you kind of make a little curved line. But on the bottom of the stingray, or the lower part of the body, it curves around the other way. So not only does this kind of look like a kite, it also looks like a shield. So it's shaped sort of like that. It's raised up a little bit. And then the eyes, of course, are right in the front. So I'm gonna make some marks. Then the body tapers back slowly, like that. And there's a little bit of like ribs. I'm not making these really dark. The stingray is not exactly straight edge, sharp edge like a kite is, because it's a real live living thing. That's just the way nature is. See, I'm not making this even at all. Now, the tail. It's not straight ever. I'm just gonna make a big old S shape. And then we're making it smaller and smaller and smaller as it goes down. Till you get to a point. Now that's basically the outline. Now, if you wanna shade it, I take a flat pencil. We start at the eyeball and I bring the pencil around and let the edge of the pencil 
make the shaving. The harder you press, of course, the darker it gets. Then you do the same thing on the opposite side. And again, you don't have to be so careful or even. And then I get lighter and lighter and lighter as we come to the, the crown, the top of the head. So I'm gonna make the eyeballs just jet black. So there's just no question where the eyes are. Now I'm just gonna come around the outside edge a little bit and make it darker. And the reason I'm doing this this way is because it has little bitty fins in inside the fin, like ribs. And you can make as little or as much detail as you want to it. The tail is not flat, it's round. So we have to make one side darker than the other. And we're leaving a little light in the middle. And that's what makes it look round. To enhance it, make it stand out more, you can take a marker or a heavier, heavier pen and follow your shape. Now this way it becomes more like a cartoon than a realistic drawing. And there you have the drawing more like a, a cartoon. Okay, I don't want to pick a favorite, but if I had to, this has to be my favorite place at the aquarium. Shark Canyon! How many, oh, how many sharks do you have? <laughs> we have so many sharks in here. So we have seven species of sharks in here. We have black tip sharks, black nose sharks, white tip sharks, bonnet head sharks, zebra sharks, nurse sharks, and sandbar sharks. So we, we definitely have quite a few. They are beautiful and amazing. And are those stingrays? So we also do, We've, we have the uh, cow nose rays, and then we also have some southern stingrays that are huge in here also. One more question. How many gallons of water? 250,000 gallons of salt water. All right, it's not just about my questions. We've got two great questions from the kids. Is the whale shark the biggest shark in the ocean? Bran and Frio worked on this float together. Okay, and then why are sharks different colors? So another great question. So most of the time that has to do with camouflage and sort of where it is that they live within the water column. So zebra sharks, even though they have this sort of pretty looking, uh, <laughs> more spots than stripes, um, but that's just because that's the way the water kind of gets modeled over them and then they can, uh, you know, sort of hide a little bit like that with that coloring. Other sharks might be light underneath but dark on top because they might sort of do some of their hunting from up above. That way, if you're looking up from below and you see the white, it blends in with the sun. And then if you're looking down below, then it looks a little bit darker, blending in with the, with the water that's down below them as well. So a lot of that has to do with camouflage. And how big is the biggest shark? So, you know what? Honestly, scientists are really still trying to discover how big are some of the sharks? How deep do some sharks live? But one of the biggest that people might recognize are whale sharks, and they actually will get up to be about 18 to 33 feet in length and even weigh up to 41,000 pounds. 41,000? 41, so 41,000 pounds, a huge shark. They're filter feeders, very docile, beautiful, amazing animals. There's so much to learn. <laughs> there really is. Definitely a lot of amazing sharks in the ocean. We should be doing as much as we can to help to protect the sharks that are out there in the ocean. There are some uh, challenges that they are definitely facing. So we're hoping that when people do come and see the sharks here at Shark Canyon, that will also translate to activities that can also help to protect sharks out there in the ocean. Anything that we can do to protect any waterway near us, that all of the water on our entire planet is connected. So anything that we do with the water here will eventually make its way out into the ocean where it affects all of the animals that live in the ocean environment as well. your markers, your pencils, your paper. Let's get creative. Okay, next I'm going to show you how to copy a picture of a shark like out of a book and make it bigger. I traced this shark out of a picture out of a book. 
These are one inch squares on some clear plastic. Then you lay that on top of your picture. I want to make this shark two times as big on this paper. So if these squares are one inch, how big do the squares have to be on the paper? Two inches. So I'm going to really quickly draw some two inch squares on this. Two, four, six, eight. I'm going to number the squares. We start at the bottom. One, two, three. And we're going to do the same thing across this way. That's our corner where we start from. This line is this line. And we see that this fin is just a curved line. Always make these little tick marks so you know where you're going. There, your fin is there and it's in the perfect size and the perfect shape. Now what happens? We go to the next square. You count up. Then, where does it go from there? In this square? That'll be this square. Okay, so now we see we have all these marks. What do you do? Just connect the dots. Okay, so you get the idea. So we have the basic outline of the shark. Forget that, that was a little mistake I did. Even artists make mistakes. That's why they invented erasers. So if the sun's coming down on this fish, on this shark, I would say, let's make it come from this direction up here. So all this part is gonna be lighter than these parts down here, especially on the other side. So I'm just gonna really quickly shade this in. So that's your basic pencil sketch of a shark, and then again, if you want more emphasis, make it more cartoon-like, you can just outline it again with your marker. So you can do this not only with fish, but any picture that you see, including a person. And sometimes I make the eyes bigger than they really are, just to make it stand out. And there's your shark. So Kat, this is another really cool part of the aquarium. Where are we? So it really is cool. This area we call the deep, and it just has some sort of mysterious, unique, interesting types of animals down here. So we have the coral uh, habitat right behind us, which is this beautiful. Yep, and then we have all different kinds of jellies, and we have some new habitats coming in as well. So maybe I'll keep that zipped up though for right now. All right, now, <laughs> and then we also have a question about an octopus. Hello, my name is Rylan Curtis, and this is Jimmy the Mardi Gras octopus. My question is for the aquarium, and I want to know why do the octopus, why does the octopus shoot ink, and what is it made out of? Thank you. Ryland, an amazing flow. It even lights up. So why do octopuses shoot ink? So that's a great question. It's really all about protection and survival. So they will shoot that ink when they feel that they need to escape from a, a predator or a dangerous situation. And they're gonna shoot it to be able to sort of like, you know, it's like smoke and mirrors, right? It's like, shoo, now there's a black curtain so you can't see me while I shoot away and hide and protect myself. And they can do it when they want to do it or they do it just because they're scared? They do it when they want to do it. They really are controlling that. I mean, it, it might be a very quick uh, reaction, but at the same time, it's on purpose. It is definitely that fight or flight response. And at that point, it is, I'm choosing to do this so I can finish this up and, and get myself out of here and, and safe and sound. They really are amazing creatures. Yeah. So what's the ink made out of? It's actually made out of something called melanin. And melanin is something that we even have in our own skin yeah. as well. Yep, and so when we're out in the sun, it's a way of protecting ourselves to uh, create a little bit of color and protection in our skin. And so it's just, uh, it's that in great concentration is what that is, but it's made out of melanin. 
All right, it's time to take this parade back outside to the heart and soul of Union Station, the trains. All right, back outside by the trains because that's the entire reason that Union Station was built. We're with Lexi Pazlowski, the sales manager here at Union Station. So Max, what's your question? Hi, my name is Max. Um, my question is, I want to know how does a train move on the tracks? So Lexi, how do the wheels move on the tracks? So it's really fascinating actually. Um, the wheels are connected by a metal axle underneath the train that has grooves um, in the insides and the outsides of the wheels. And as they connect both sides of the wheels, it keeps both sets of wheels moving together at the same time. Chugga, 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 Now that we know how they move, let's draw one. Okay, we're gonna start with our tracks. Okay, so now we're gonna do the most important part of the engine, and that's the cylinder. So the wheels are gonna be ovals too. We're doing, see, we keep doing these ovals. This is a really, really simple train, but you could spend hours decorating your train, painting sides on it. Also important at the very end of every train is a caboose. Everybody's seen that across the sky. And there you have it, a cartoon train. All right, let's continue this parade to check out some of the outdoor activities at Union Station. This wheel is so amazing and here's a couple of fun facts. It's actually taller than the Statue of Liberty but can fit under the arch and my favorite part, the gondolas are always 72 degrees. Now let's have a question about another place that has a Ferris wheel, although it's a lot smaller. This is Avery from third grade. Um, my question is how long did it take to build the city museum? Great question Avery. Actually, City Museum is never done building. Some of our most iconic attractions have gained years after our opening. And in fact, we still got much more planned for the future, like a 90-foot slide on the outside, a whole other section of the roof. Hi, my name's Emerson, and I am seven years old. I would like to know, what is the praying mantis on top of the City Museum's roof made out of? Thanks, Emerson. I love the praying mantis. In fact, it was at the Botanical Garden before it was at the City Museum and on our front entrance before the wind blew it off. But what this uh, praying mantis made of? Basically, stainless steel is what makes the armature Bondo and fiberglass. Take a look next time you're here. Great job, Avery, Emerson, and the Soulard School. We've got one more question about the City Museum. Hi, my name is Cooper and I go to LPA. So I made a flow about the City Museum. So I made a slide and I made a school bus on top. My question for the city museum is um, how many slides do you have and how long is your biggest one? Hey Cooper, that's the question everybody wants to know. There are over 30 slides within the city museum with the longest being the number two 10 story spiral slide. It's 152 feet, six inches long. You also come back and check it out next time you're here. Great job, Cooper. I love the slides, too. Now let's head over to another fun place here at Union Station, the carousel. I don't know about you, but I think carousels are so much fun. You know where there's another place that has a carousel? The zoo. And we've got a question about the zoo. Hi, my name is Georgie. I did my float on the polar bear from the St. Louis Zoo, born in winter of 2013 on the northwest coast of Alaska. Polar bears are usually found in the Arctic, located at the top of the globe. In the Arctic, there aren't many animals because not many animals can survive in the cold weather. Polar bears normally eat seal, fish, and if they get lucky, a walrus. My question is, 
Why are polar bears white and is it because of their climate? Great question, Georgie. But the answer is actually yes and no. Polar bears have adapted a lot of really neat features to help them keep warm uh, in their very cold climate. But if you look at a hair shaft under a microscope, you'll notice that it's actually transparent or colorless. We see white because all the light in the color spectrum is absorbed except for the color white. So polar bears appear white to us. You'll also notice that all the hairs are hollow and that acts as an insulator to help trap warm air, similar to us climbing into a warm sleeping bag. And the last thing I want to mention is that if you shave the hair off of a polar bear, it actually, they have black skin and the black skin actually helps keep them warmer, similar to us wearing darker colored clothing in the summertime. And don't forget, the St. Louis Zoo is open in the winter. So please be sure to make your free reservation at the zoo's website, stlzoo.org. Let's send it back to you, Heidi, at Union Station. Great question, Georgie. Who knew? Now we've got a question from another fantastic place in St. Louis, the Magic House. Hi, I'm Clayton. Hi, I'm Gordon. We made a magic house. No, wow. At the magic house, I love to play in the sea. I like to play in a sandbox too. My question is, how does that, how does the lightning bolt stick up your hair? Well, that is a great question, Clayton. How does this ball make our hair stand up? Well. If we look inside this big glass tube here, you can see there's a big rubber belt. And that rubber belt spins really, really fast. And it generates a bunch of electrons. And those electrons, they go up inside our metal ball here. And then they also go into our arms and into our bodies, because people conduct electricity too. So when those electrons go into your body and they get on your hair, your hair starts pushing each other apart. Because when you have two things, like two hairs that are charged the same way, they don't want to stay together. They want to get apart. So they push each other and they stand up on end just like this. So that is a very good question, Clayton. Thank you very much for that question. And hopefully we will see you all at the Magic House sometime soon. Thanks, Clayton. Isn't it so much fun to see your hair sticking up everywhere? All right, did you know that Union Station actually has a koi pond. You know where else you can find a koi pond? The Missouri Botanical Garden, and we've got a great question about the fish. I'm Luke from Opia, and I learned about the Botanical Garden. This is a big, huge flower. My question is, how much fish food do you buy each year? Thanks, Luke, for your great question about how much fish food do we buy annually for the koi in a Japanese garden. Surprisingly, the answer is 2,960 pounds. That's about a ton and a half of food that we buy each year for the fish. Unfortunately, it's too cold. We won't see very many koi today. They will head to lower depths of the lake. Uh, our lake is, uh, on average, 11 feet deep. So when it gets extreme and the temperatures drop, uh, they'll just seek uh, the lower depths of the lake where it's a little bit warmer. There are sunfish, there are bluegill, and there are largemouth bass. There are probably a couple of species of catfish in here as well. The average koi weighs somewhere around 35 pounds. It's been estimated that koi can live to be somewhere around 75 years old. Thanks again, Luke, for your great question. I hope that I will be able to see you soon at the garden as you're feeding some of our fish. Origami in the Garden opens this spring at the Missouri Botanical Garden. This monumental exhibit includes stunning large-scale metal sculptures as tall as 25 feet. These sculptures tell the story of origami, the Japanese art of paper folding. For more details, visit mobot.org slash origami. All right. Well, let's go back to Heidi at Union Station. Now we have one more question. This one is for the Science Center. My question is for, for the Science Center is how many stars are in our Milky Way? Hi, Cooper and Luke. My name's Will, and I'm manager of the McDonald Planetarium at the St. Louis Science Center. It sounds like we want to know how many stars are in our Milky Way galaxy. Well, galaxies like the Milky Way are made up of stars. 
The most important star to us is the sun, the star we see during the day. But if we could count all the others, we think there's between 100 and 400 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. That is a huge number, but it really is an estimate. We can't count every star that's in our galaxy, so we rely on science to make estimates about how many stars form our galaxy in space. As time goes on and we build more evidence, those estimates will get better, but for now you can rest assured knowing that when you look up in the sky, there are many, many stars staring back at you. We hope you can visit us at the planetarium again, but until then, here's wishing you clear skies, pleasant nights, and let's send it on back to Heidi at Union Station. I don't know about you guys, but I have learned so much about so many of our incredible places here in St. Louis. That does it. That wraps up the 2021 Mardi Gras Shoebox Parade. Until next year, bye. Thank you for joining us for the Shoebox Float Parade. Be sure to join us for the Wiener Dog Derby, February 13th.